This is a BBC podcast. You can get all our podcasts and our terms of use at bbcworldservice.com slash podcasts. BBC World Service, welcome to The Y Factor. I'm Mike Williams. One day last December, newsreaders around the world sighed with relief. All of them grateful that they weren't on duty. For the past 20 years, Janice Lokelani Keihana Iku Kawakahi Hulihe e Kahauna Ele has had to carry two IDs. The authorities in Hawaii are changing the format of the island's ID cards because of complaints by a woman whose 35 letter surname wouldn't fit. Janice Keihana Iku Kawakahi Hulihe e Kahauna Ele, whose traditional Hawaiian name comes from her late husband, said she would never consider using a shortened version because she loved the Polynesian culture. She says it's created a number of problems, from not being able to travel to being questioned by police during a traffic stop. Ms. Kehani Kukua Kahihulie Kahanaele also rejected suggestions that she could use her maiden name, Worth. Last week, we talked about given names. This week, it's the turn of the family name. It's usually fixed by convention, and though the rules vary from place to place, most family names speak about our origins. They give a partial history of our forebears, more often than not our forefathers. My name is Jill Filipovich, and I am a columnist at The Guardian, an attorney, and a freelance journalist. Filipovich, what does your last name say about you and say about the history of your family? Do you know? Yeah, I mean, I, I know a bit. A Serbian last name. In Serbia, it's a relatively common last name. In the U.S., it's quite uncommon. I've met very few other Filipoviches, and as far as I can tell from the internet, there is no other Jill Filipovic, because Jill is not exactly a common Serbian first name. Jill describes herself as a radical feminist, so the translation of Filipovic seems a little ironic. Right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I guess I'm a son of Philip. The Sun Convention, sure, you know, is, is reflective of patrilineal naming practices that extend back generations, you know, in a variety of cultures around the world. It does speak to at least part of my history and only a quarter of it. It's only, you know, it's my father's father. It does go back to, you know, pre-World War II Serbian goat farmers, <laughs> um, which definitely, you know, is interesting. It, you know, it, I think, emphasizes or at least speaks to the fact that my family is a family of immigrants. And I think that's important. I like carrying a name that I understand that it reflects at least a little bit of my personal history. And I would feel quite a bit of sadness, I think, giving that up for a name that reflects a culture and an ethnicity and a heritage that isn't mine. I'm Gregory Clark. I'm professor of economics at the University of California, Davis, and I'm author of the book uh, The Sun Also Rises, Surnames and the History of Social Mobility. Surnames and the History of Social Mobility. What's the link? Surnames in many societies, when they're first created, contain important information about the status of the bearers. And those surnames gradually lose that information if there's social mobility. The rate at which they lose the information can be translated into the rate of social mobility. How do you examine this, this thesis, this information? I started actually looking at names as a way of actually being able to measure mobility over long periods and in the distant past. Social mobility, and what we mean by social mobility is how closely connected are you to the income of your father, to the occupation, to the wealth. Even things like longevity are, again, markers of social status. It turns out when you start looking at surnames, you come across a very startling discovery, which is that all the current estimates of social mobility tend to vastly overestimate its extent because those current estimates should mean that within one or two generations, all surnames in England should have equivalent status. It turns out that that's not true. Surnames can hold on to their status for something like 300 to 500 years. How do you test a thing like that? Oh, uh, so we can do... Here's an, a simple example. We can go to, take rare surnames, go to Oxford and Cambridge, and look at which rare surnames show up at Oxford and Cambridge around 1800. Then we can ask, what's the probability of someone with that same name appearing now at Oxford and Cambridge? And the answer is, it's still four times greater <laughs> than that for the average person in Britain. The nice thing we find is, in the end, we're all equal, but the end is 10 to 20 generations from now. 
I can't wait that long. <laughs> it depends on your, your philosophical attitude, right? My name is uh, Muriel Zaga. Uh, one of those difficult to spell surnames, and I work as a um, writer and um, film reviewer. Her family carried the name from Europe to the Middle East and back again. She was born in France and now lives in London. My father's family is Syrian Jewish, and I'm told it's a fairly common Syrian Jewish name, very uncommon in France, in my experience. Uh, and then originally, originally before Syria, I think it must have come from Spain. So it would have been pronounced Zaha, I suppose, and spelled slightly differently, and then it evolved over the centuries. But we have no written records, almost none. It was a very difficult name to grow up with because it begins with a Z. So very often I would be at school, for example, the very last on the list, and I'd get chopped off by the printer. So I have had the experience a couple of times of standing in the playground at school, waiting to be called and not being called because I'd fallen off the list. Um, so that gives you grit, I think, this kind of experience. Are you proud of that name? Very proud, very proud, many reasons. It's a Jewish name, and that matters to me, and I'm also the last of my line, really, on my father's side. So if I changed my name on getting married, then the name would have gone. While given names change with fashion, the names of families are remarkably resilient. They're slow to mutate, and that lets us track them over time. Take my country. What's amazing about uh, British history is... We can look generation after generation at the rise and fall of different social groups using these surnames. And when you look at that pattern, you would think nothing ever happened in British history, right? The Black Death, the Protestant Reformation, the Civil Wars, the Industrial Revolution, the reign of Victoria, the democratization of the society, World War I it makes no impact in terms of social mobility. You, we're under the grip of some slow, ineluctable process. And uh, what's impressive about this process actually is that the names seem to reveal a kind of social physics. And that's, as I say, was very exciting and unexpected outcome of looking at something as ordinary and as unremarkable to most people as what's your surname. In Northern Ireland, during the Troubles, learning someone's name could often tell you a lot about them, even sometimes about their faith and their politics. In Rwanda, during the genocide, the wrong name at a militia checkpoint could be the death of you. As well as benign histories, family names can bind us to clans and tribes and factions. They can tie us in to old rivalries, like that between Shakespeare's Montagues and Capulets in Old Verona. "'Tis but thy name that is my enemy. "'Thou art thyself, though not a Montague. "'What's Montague? "'It is nor hand, nor foot, nor arm, nor face, "'nor any other part belonging to a man. "'Oh, be some other name! "'What's in a name? "'That which we call a rose by any other name "'would smell as sweet.' I think certain cultural traditions, especially those that are attached to sentimental emotions and things like love, uh, which I don't call sentimental to be derisive, those I think can be the most difficult to change in a culture. Juliet, if I remember rightly, told Romeo that the problem lay only in his family name. and He promised to change it. He said, just call me love instead. <laughs> Romeo. Doff thy name, and for that name which is no part of thee, take all myself. I take thee at thy word. Call me but love, and I'll be new baptised. Henceforth, I never will be Romeo. Our names are our identities, and I think a big problem is that women are raised understanding that their identities are always relational to someone else. So they're dependent you know, on a husband or on your parents, whereas young men, from the moment they're born, they understand that the name that they're given is the name that they'll have for their entire lives. And I do think it's you know, psychologically and, and culturally quite harmful for women to not attach a permanent name to their own selves. Jill Filipovich is a person who has existed in the universe for 30 years. You know, if I got married and I was Jill Smith, I mean, that 
that's a different person. That name means something else. I have a whole history attached to my name, not just a family history of, you know, my father and his father, but of me personally, of my accomplishments, of graduating from college, of graduating from law school, you know, of writing a series of articles, of making friends. And, you know, even in today's you know, social media environment, having a Facebook account that has the same name on it as I had in high school so that old friends can find me if they want to reconnect. Women lose that when we change our names. Are you married? I'm not. I assume that if you were to marry, you would remain Jill Filipovich. I, I would, yes. What about any children of that marriage? People get angry enough when I say that women shouldn't change their names, but this is where things get quite sticky. I think that kids should keep their mother's names. That's not fair, but it's also not fair that kids have been taking their father's names for generations. I understand you think the naming conventions are unfair, unreasonable to women, but as long as they exist, as long as there is consistency, it does mean that we can look back through history and track families and, and family trees. A free-for-all would make that, that very difficult. You know, it, it would and it wouldn't. I think it's, frankly, much easier now to reconstruct family trees going back. We are so much more interconnected than we've ever been. And yes, you know, the naming convention makes it easier to sort of look back at, especially your father's side and his father's side. But that also loses the entire history of women in your family. And I think shifting the naming convention might necessitate a little more work in, in reconstructing the family tree. But I think in a lot of ways would force us to kind of expand and look at the fact that women make up half our families too. In China, a woman keeps her own name on marriage, and the child is allowed to take either. In Spain and most Latin American countries, it's a legal requirement for a child to take the name of both parents written without a hyphen. The Germanic countries tend to use that useful little dash. But France, with its, let's say, well-formed bureaucracy, got into a terrible tangle when it tried to regulate the matter, recognising women's rights while also preserving the nobility of the old dynastic families which already carried the hyphen. The solution was, well, what would have happened if Muriel Zaga married a Monsieur Chabon? I would be uh, Muriel Zaga hyphen 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 space hyphen space Chabon which I think is a little bit of a mouthful. I think there was resistance to that, but it could have been worse. There was talk of using a slash instead or maybe an asterisk, you know. Uh, civil servants having a <laughs> really fun time trying to, dis trying to decide what would be the best thing. It, there was too much resistance. I don't, think, I, I don't think it went down that easily. It looks silly. The policy was rapidly dropped, though Paris does still try to keep a grip on things. When I had a child seven and a half years ago, I thought it'd be nice to give him my surname as a middle name. So he's called Hector, and then as one of his middle names, I gave him my name, Zaga. And when I registered him here in London at the council, that was absolutely fine. Then I went to the French consulate to register him with the French administration because he has dual nationality. And as soon as I explained, well, as soon as I filled in the form in front of the lady at the consulate, she said, no, no you can't do that. With, in French law, you're not allowed to give your surname to your child as a middle name. Why not? Because. <laughs> because French law does not allow it. I'm not quite sure why, but that's just the way things are. And you know, with the French administration, I don't know how much experience you've had of it, but it's not really a place where you're going to argue or try to make a case for anything. So as a result, my son has two slightly different identities in, in <laughs> England and in France, because on his British passport, he, is, he does have my name as part of his identity, and on his um, French passport, he doesn't. I took it on the chin because I'm French, and I've gone through years and years of talking to officials in libraries and universities and so on, and this is the kind of response you get often when you make slightly unusual requests. My husband, who is British, a freeborn Briton, was incensed and talks about it all the time <laughs> as an example of French iniquity. There is a rivalry between Britain and France, and it's an ancient one. It was in 1066 that the French-speaking Normans conquered Britain. They brought a new language, new rules, and new rulers too. What this new upper class also brought was surnames. 
And so back in the Doomsday Book of 1086, we actually see for the first time uh, systematically the surnames that come to dominate a lot of upper-class Britain over many succeeding centuries, such as Montgomery, De Vere, Baskerville, uh, Villiers. And the interesting thing about these surnames is that because they have a French origin, they actually still sound somewhat elite to people in modern England. Gregory Clark has a problem with the Normans. There's something special about their names. As he tracks social change through the lists of university students and the military roles, the De Veres and the Villiers, the Fitzwilliams, the Beechams, the Beaumonts and the Baskervilles, they just won't go away. The only anomaly in this study is actually these Norman surnames because they have persisted For nearly a thousand years. For nearly a thousand years. And the degree of this persistence is also greater in certain spheres such as politics. And so whereas the average high status name from England in 1300 is just averagely represented in Parliament by the 19th century, Norman surnames are still eight times more likely to show up in the Parliament roles than they are to show up in the population as a whole. And that's a startling uh, overrepresentation. And... What we do then is in studying social mobility, we've actually tended to put those names to the side because what I think is happening here is that a lot of the modern Normans are fake Normans. (laughs) They're people who acquired those names but not by descent, by either choosing an uncle's name or choosing their spouse's name or just cheating. And perhaps that testifies to the power of the family name, the fact that some people are willing to change it, to lose their true heritage in an attempt to join the elite or to fit better into society. In 1917, with anti-German sentiment running high in Britain, a man called George changed the family name from saxe coburg and Gotha to the English Windsor. He was usually known as King George V, and his granddaughter Elizabeth sits on the throne today. My thanks to the producer Bill Law, and thanks to you for listening. There are dozens of different podcasts now available from the BBC, including news, documentaries, science, business, arts and sport. For details of them all, go to bbcworldservice.com slash podcasts.